Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor on social media where I'm going to do another round of Q&A for you today. Um, if any of you would like any photography related questions answered, I will do my very best to help you within reason, of course. Now, uh, the other exciting thing that we're going to do today is we are going to announce the winners of our competition red. The theme was red. We run these amazing quarterly competitions. I say amazing because we get some great entries and we give away some great prizes. We give away uh, Broncolor Cirrus lighting kits, Lee filters, Canon cameras. And some people think, oh yeah, but you don't give them away really. You just get them for free and give them away. That's not true. We actually buy this stuff, okay? I've got no affiliation with Canon other than I use some Canon cameras now and again. Uh, we buy the 5D Mark IV, we give it away. We, buy, we bought a 5D Mark IV body, which is today's prize. One lucky winner is gonna take away that 5D Mark IV. We do get the Broncolor Cirrus lighting kits less expensive uh, because obviously uh, my association working with Broncolor. So they kindly give us a, a generous discount on them, but we don't get this stuff for free. This comes out of our own pocket. So I hope you appreciate it, um, but uh, we like to uh, keep you guys happy as well. And it's wonderful to see so many great entries. So I'm gonna be revealing some of the best entries in uh, in the competition red. We actually went for red, I don't know, probably since Christmas kind of was a, theme we thought was quite nice and we had some amazing shots in so I'll go through some of those with you uh, later. I'm going to show you the shortlist shots. Uh, the whole team and I here we shortlisted it and then we uh, came down to uh, the few lucky winners which we'll look at. So uh, obviously if any of you want to ask uh, photography related questions send them in they'll pop in on this iPad from the different social media channels that we're on live at the moment and I will uh, do my best to answer those. Now, what can we talk about first? Um, right, tomorrow, tomorrow's live show, that's on Carl Taylor Education, is a member's critique, and I'm critiquing product photography images that have been sent in to us. So if you'd like to tune in uh, for that particular show, you can check that out on Carl Taylor Education in the live show section. Uh, tomorrow. Um, also, I want to talk about um, another uh, shot, basically, another photograph that I was very pleased with um, from the from a previous live show. But actually, I've just thought, no, I'm not going to talk about that now. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because I've got something else I want to talk about. Right here, we've been getting lots of people ask for jewellery photography. So we've made Loads of new uh, jewellery modules. We've got this one on rings, shooting rings, then on the focus stacking, how to light them, how to avoid all the nasty reflections. We asked, uh, people asked about jewellery, about little sets. So we've got two new ones on jewellery. Uh, and this one on gemstones on jewellery was meant to be coming in uh, January or February. But actually, we have decided to release it today. So there it is today instead. And let me just refresh this page. So uh, if you guys want to see this particular shoot, that's the, uh, that's the setup. This is the, the gemstone that we photographed. Uh, let me just see if I've got the actual file. I think I had it here on my desktop somewhere. Here it is, gemstones and dust. Um, let's just move these tabs out of the way and get that full screen and zoom in a little bit. So this is the shot that we uh, produced, which is basically a, an aquamarine, quite an expensive necklace this, and thanks to Ray and Scott for loaning me this. Um, and you can see I created a, a background, a slate background, and then these matte um, panels, along with this uh, sort of sparkly black um, stones and dust there to create the little set but obviously the the trick was in lighting it and getting the gemstone and the diamonds to pop and uh, we, we we've done a nice little tutorial I would say there and we've got plenty more of these jewelry ones coming because obviously you guys asked for it so um, we like to try and provide you with uh, what you were asking for so that one isn't available in February it's available now right available now on Carl Taylor education website Right, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Let me have a sip of my 
coffee before we continue. So, first question from I don't know who because the name isn't there. Uh, can you recommend a good lighting setup for less than $500 or maybe even $250? Ooh, um, that's a very tricky one because I think that's, that's almost too much of a tall order. If you, if you think about studio lighting, um, and I assume you're talking about studio lighting, and I assume you're talking about studio flash lighting, You've got the problem in that um, you need lighting stands, you need modifiers to put on those lights, such as, um, you know, uh, soft boxes, parabolic umbrellas, reflectors, that sort of stuff. I mean, you can make scrims and things less expensive, but there are certain accessories that you need to go with those lights to make them effective because the lights on their own really aren't that usable uh, in most instances. And then you've got the cost of the lights. And then it depends what you want the lights to do. Do you want fast flash duration lights, which cost more money? Do you just need standard sort of speed lights, uh, not speed lights, standard sort of flash duration lights? Do you want continuous light? Uh, what sort of thing are you looking for? There are a number of factors, and there are a number of reasons why continuous light might not be as good as flash lighting for certain situations and vice versa. Um, and I think it would be a tall order to find the lights under $500. Now, there are lights like Alien B and Einstein's, which are the cheapest of the fast flash duration ones. But from what I've heard, they're not always consistent and they're not always, I, I know a couple of friends of mine that have had them and they said they fell apart after a bit of use. So they're not anywhere near as good as the Broncolor Cirrus or some of the Broncolor range. I used to shoot with Elinchrom lights that were quite, um, I'd say sort of mid-market pricing and then there was the Bowens lights that were less expensive and seemed to be pretty good but unfortunately Bowens went bust recently but um, you can still pick up their lights. So um, yeah it's a difficult one. I, I suppose the very very cheapest way of creating uh, lighting is to, is to find uh, some high quality LED continuous lighting and simply using scrims with it. That might be good for some simple product setups but beyond that, it might be a little bit difficult to use. So unfortunately, you're gonna to have to shop around with the different lighting brands and take a look at what's on offer. I know there's a, 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 chi a few Chinese brands now, Godox is one of them that might have some less expensive lighting as well. But as with usual with these things, you get what you pay for, unfortunately. Right, now, um, Sorin Altano says, is it that important to save my web pictures in sRGB if I work on them in Pro Photo RGB? Um, yes, I think it is, Soren. Um, as a matter of fact, actually, I work on my pictures in Adobe RGB 98 for the post-production part, the final part, and then I convert them to sRGB for my website. And the tests I've run of putting an Adobe RGB or Pro Photo RGB or sRGB, the sRGB ones always seem to look better when displayed in a variety of browsers. So yes, when you convert it to the JPEG for uploading on your website, I'd say yes, also convert it to sRGB. Winnie223 says, if you're extremely short of money, crop or full frame in a few words? Well, I guess the crop cameras are slightly less expensive because the sensor is smaller, therefore, Smaller sensor usually means less expensive. However, the full frame sensors have come down somewhat in price. Cameras, I think like the 6D, much less expensive full frame camera uh, than, than, than the cameras that were around some years ago. Personally, I prefer full frame. I always prefer a larger sensor, uh, prefer the look that it gives. I'm also familiar coming from a film background, working on 35 millimeter film. And I actually use a, a, a medium format digital sensor for my studio work. Um, so uh, in brief, Winnie, if you can afford a full frame sensor, I'd recommend uh, to go down that route, but I'm not quite sure what the price comparisons are with crop and full frame. Sentil Mala says, hi Carl, Sentil from India. I just want to know, is high speed sync related to which part of the camera and why it is not given in entry level cameras? Um, well, high speed sync in 35 mil cameras is actually related more to the flash trigger and the flash system that you use. It basically allows the flash burst to pulse for a longer period so that it can synchronize with 
higher shutter speeds and you have to use the right trigger and system to do it. So you should be able to use that on most DSLR cameras. There is a difference between that and actual higher flash sync speeds. Higher flash sync speeds can be uh, obtained in certain cameras. Some of the uh, electronic shutter cameras can maybe achieve 1 360th of a second sync speed. And medium format cameras such as the Phase and the uh, Hasselblad like I've got there behind me, uh, they use a leaf shutter system where the shutter is in the lens and that can sync up to 1 2000th of a second on the Hasselblad H6 with no need for use of any high speed sync um, stuff, uh, trickery if you like from the um, the transmitter or the flash system so you can actually shoot at the normal range of exposure or, or range of f-stops etc on the flash system. Uh, Winnie223 got another question, wow. Uh, your recommendations on budget focus stacking software, thanks in advance. Uh, it sounds like Winnie is on a budget uh, based on the two questions she's put in so far. Um, I, I actually only use um, Photoshop because I pay the monthly whatever it is ten dollars nine pounds a month and I use the focus stacking that's in Photoshop so um, I'm afraid I don't really know of any other focusing uh, stacking software that might be cheaper because obviously as part of my work I'm using Lightroom I'm using Photoshop regularly so I, I pay the, uh, the the monthly subscription to CC and uh, they've got focus stacking as one of the um, uh, one of the features within a, a Photoshop CC. Uh, Siddhar Sahin, uh, now <laughs> that's funny, Siddhar, right? Siddhar was a, the, a previous winner of a Canon 5D Mark IV uh, that we gave away uh, last year. Now Siddhar says, hi Carl, why Broncolor is more active in the US than here in the UK? There's been amazing offers lately from Broncolor US, but unfortunately not in the UK. Sorry, it's not really a photography question. Well, it is a photography question and it's a good question and it actually leads me on to something else that I want to talk about. I don't know the answer to that. I guess you would have to contact Chris Burfoot at Broncolor UK. He's the UK uh, representative for Broncolor and organises all the stuff. He may have the answers on that. Uh, one thing, Siddhar, that you might be interested in and I'm just going to get this because um, Chris Burfoot, who I know well, um, asked me if I could mention it. And if we take a look here on this page, this is Broncolor UK users Facebook page. Now this is a group that I believe is open to anyone, not just uh, Broncolor um, users, but um, I think you, you have to apply to join the group and Chris Burfoot is in charge of the group. And basically Broncolor users within the group share uh, pictures, share stories, share tips and tricks and anything to do with Broncolor. So if you are a Broncolor user or interested in Broncolor uh, and you're in the UK, um, then you might be interested in joining this Facebook group that Chris Burfoot is running. And maybe Siddhar, maybe you can ask your question in there and as Berth is the admin for that uh, group uh, hopefully he can give you um, some answers. Right uh, moving on Andrew McLean says do you recommend any car photographers? Um, I used to know a couple of car photographers but that was some time ago. The, the truth is Andrew oh, oh actually there is a guy I, I, I kind of vaguely know through someone else called Tim Wallace who is uh, a very good car photographer um, I've got to say though, the ones that I knew previously, they actually have moved over to CGI now. So basically they, they shoot the back plate images, the location, the landscape image, and then the car is CGI'd into the scene and they use the mapping of all of the photography information that the photographers have captured for a sort of hemisphere uh, around and then they map that lighting into the car and all the reflections from the surrounding scenery. Very clever stuff. Um, so that's basically how I think most car stuff is done these days. But there, there are still actual car photographers. And as I say, Tim Wallace is one that uh, I know of you might want to check out. Peter Stokes says, Carl, could you do something on group portraiture in the future? Um, yes, we'll look at that. Um, group portraiture in the studio can be difficult for some photographers, partly because of space. Um, and lighting can be difficult on groups because you can imagine if you've got groups of people all next to each other, some sort of alongside each other, some maybe forwards. If you light from the side, they cast shadows onto one another and your lighting goes all over the place. 
So what I do for group, excuse me, what I do for group portraiture is light from above with a big light, if I can, from front. Because if I can get in from front and above, the light can get down through the gaps, casting no shadows, and at least it's sort of semi-top lighting, top front lighting. Now, if I can use the big, um, the big Para 222 to do that, I will, because then I can throw loads of even light frontal. But obviously, if you don't have one of those, you can set up a multiple of umbrellas, silver umbrellas, or whatever modifiers you've got from above on a few lighting stands, basically behind you and above. And the further you can put those lighting modifiers away from your group, then uh, the less the fall off of light. So you don't get an intense fall off of light from uh, the light being too close where it'd be very bright on the front person and then darker on the one behind. If you can put your lights further away, then because of the inverse square law um, fall off, basically the person at the front won't be much different in exposure to the person further back. So that's my quick tip if I can give you one for group photography. Right, next question is from Martins Ribeiro. Uh, he says, hi, Carl, a few questions regarding copyright, if you don't mind. Do you send your copyright terms and conditions of business with a fee proposal? Uh, so, so question one, yes, I do. I have a terms and conditions um, of business, which also includes my licensing arrangements and everything else, uh, uh, fees, payment dates, surcharges and all that sort of nonsense on there. That goes to the client and any client that I work for has to sign that and uh, I've got long-standing clients that have signed it years ago, so I don't give them one every shoot, but it's a general terms and conditions of doing business with me, especially for new clients. Uh, now, part two of his question is, do you contact your client when the two years of copyright are finishing? Yes, I do. Um, I, you don't have to because I've licensed the image to them for two years. So by default at two years when it's over, the, uh, the rights return to me as the photographer. But if I believe they want to continue to use the image, then obviously I need to contact them to renegotiate any rights uh, and, and offer that renewal on the license as you state there. Number three, is the usage fees agreement your proposal? Um, no, but generally you might discuss what the usage charges might be after the two years if they wanted to go back to it. Uh, and he's got one, no, one more question. He's got a lot of questions, this guy. Do you have a standard image size in pixels that you supply to your clients when they don't ask for a specific size? No, I supply them the full resolution 100 megapixel file, which is about 12,000 pixels wide. Um, I always give them the highest resolution finished image. Okay, um, now, where are we? We've got, this we've got these competition winners to reveal, but let's take a couple more questions first. And the next question is from Corin Wilkinson. Is there any way of building a Pico light for pinpointed lighting? No, there is not, Corin. Uh, it's not, not building one. A Pico light works with a projection attachment. So it's like a projector um, that you have, like a slide projector or a digital projector, whatever. It's basically got a lens system and a focusing system, and it's got these little blades that you insert to block the light to create tiny shapes. Then you focus the lens and that can make tiny, tiny little um, squares of light, shapes of light, slithers of light, great for lighting products. Um, there isn't really something I think you could build um, but sometimes I use various mirrors and types of things and other little tricks to, to do similar effects. But really, no, the Pico light with the projection attachment is quite specialist and it's a tool that I use regularly in product photography. Flavio Cavallari says, I shoot a lot of portraits on location and I'm thinking to buy a para. What is the key advantage comparing to an Octobox? Well, there's a huge difference to an Octobox, um, Flavio. I, I'm, I've got to say, you, you really need to um, watch some of our comparison, lighting comparisons videos in our um, portrait section. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's in, in this portrait section here on Carl Taylor Education. We've got some lighting comparisons and all of the physics and theory on why different lighting modifiers do what they do. And I think we've got some more over in the equipment section. So to see in detail the differences and see the actual results, you, you best head over there. But um, to just give you briefly a roundup, 
the, the way that the light comes out of, an, uh, of a para, it's kind of funneled out in a very directional, straight energy way so that the light hits the subject square on and it falls off very quickly at the side. So you get a nice shadow around the head and then you get a sort of beauty triangle. So I love using it for beauty lighting in the same sort of position that I would use um, a beauty dish. And then you can also swing it around to the side. It gives a very three dimensional light uh, the 133 para is my favourite. Um, um, an Octobox is a nice, flattering, soft light, but it's a bit sort of soft and milky generally. It doesn't have the same bite or the same dynamics that you get from uh, a parabolic uh, reflector like the para 133. Even the para 88 is pretty good, but I prefer the 133 because it's just a bit bigger and can be a bit softer. And then obviously you can focus the rod, of, or basically pull the focusing rod to move the light position, and then you can create much harder light or much softer light, all with the same modifier. But they're not cheap, so uh, obviously compared to the Octobox, I think the Octobox is a good all-rounder if you're on a budget. Raj Sharma, hello Carl, is 16-bit 35mm sensor going to be a game changer and impact medium format? Uh, no, I don't think it is. The uh, bit depth may help a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's, it's down to the physics. You know, if you've got a sensor that is that big, competing with a sensor that is that big, the bigger sensor, the light gathering ability, the, the smoothness of the tonal ranges. It's the same as in the old days in film. You know, we used to shoot, I used to shoot on 35 mil film, medium format film, and we even used to shoot on five by four inch film. That was film that was that big. Um, and the bigger the film, the smoother the tones, the more silky, the better it looked. Um, so no, I don't think it is. I mean, any improvements that we see in 35 mil, the medium format cameras usually up their game as well. And just it's, it's down to the physics of the actual sensor size that gives that different sort of quality to um, medium format from 35 mil. But don't get me wrong. I mean, there's some great 35 mil stuff going on. When I tested the Nikon D850, I thought the results were, were really, really good. Christy, Krista Calvin, Carl, please go through dot PSD files saving to dot JPEGs. Which method maintains the best quality? I've tried different ways and still face changes in quality. Would like to hear, um, well, I can describe my, my, my way of working from a PSD. So when I finished the image, color, correction, contrast, any retouching, I've got my final layer, if you like. And then if you're changing to a JPEG, but specifically if you want to make the image smaller, it, it used to be that I found if you made the image smaller in Photoshop, say going from like, 8,000 pixels to 1,000 pixels in one go, that wasn't always the best way. It was better to actually downsize the image from 8,000 to 5,000 to 3,000, then to 1,000, seemed to give a better result. But I'm not finding that anymore. So I think something to do with the uh, bicubic sampling or whatever they call it uh, on downsizing the image seems to do it absolutely fine in one step. So I resize the image from whatever, how many pixels down to the amount of pixel size that I want it. And then I simply say file save as a JPEG in Photoshop. And I usually, depending on whether it's for web or whatever, usually won't operate at lower than quality seven, mostly quality eight. And that's it. Um, that's, that's the only process I use. I just do the, the whole process in Photoshop. And you can also use the um, uh, automate script image processor command if you've got loads of them to do, so you don't have to sit and do them manually, it can just do them all for you. Um, Andrew McLean, when you save a picture from Lightroom, what size should you save it? If you could reply via text. Um, I don't know what you mean, what size. It, the size you save it depends on the purpose you're gonna use it for. So for example, if I'm given one of my clients a, a full res image file from a shoot, I'll give them the biggest file I've got, which is like 12,000 pixels wide. If I'm saving an image for uh, just a preview, just so a client can review them, I'll save them at 1,500 pixels wide. Images that I load on my website, I save at 2,500 pixels wide so that people viewing on these you know, more modern 4K or 5K monitors still get a good resulting picture. So the size that you export in pixels should be dependent on the purpose of what the image is going to be used for. Right, I'm gonna take a couple more questions and then we're gonna stop for a minute um, because I wanna get through or get onto um, these competition things. 
Uh, and I've got uh, one other thing as well, a couple of other things to talk about as well. Uh, Vlad Puha says, what is the problem from saving from PSD to JPEG? Do you mean color profile or compression? Um, I think he's referring to the previous person's question. Um, so yeah, color profile, I just set to sRGB. Uh, when I save to JPEG, if it's going to be displayed online. Pascal Gruta says, when you have to use flashlights outside at night in a city, how do you balance the warm ambient light with the flashlight, especially if you want to use a softbox? Well, it depends on the situation, Pascal, because you don't, not all city lighting is warm. I mean, some street lighting is warm. We're seeing a lot more LED street lighting that is actually daylight balanced now as well. Um, but not all street lighting, not every situation is, is, is warm. A lot of, uh, lot, there's the sodium vapor lights that are sort of yellow, horrible yellow tinge uh, that you can't really color correct for. Um, if a situation requires it, I will gel my lights. So I use Lee filter gels um, that, that they do very specific um, technical gels that correct for different types of lighting. So they have like CTO correction, so you can correct from um, daylight to, uh, to tungsten or tungsten to daylight, et cetera, et cetera. And you can wrap these gels carefully around the flash tube area, but I wouldn't leave your modeling lamps on if they're wrapped around there. Um, but then you can correct using the gels. Um, so that's the way I would do it if you need to do it. John Dawson says, Carl, do you ever use dual polarization on the light and on the lens for product shots? If so, what polarization gel do you recommend? Actually, I do. Um, let me give you a good example of, um, of that in action. Um, I'm just going to jump over to my website here. Um, now, insert, actually, while we're on this one, th this is my Squarespace website, by the way. This is, this is not the Carl Taylor Education site, which is a different website. This is my commercial photography website, which is at carltaylor.com. So while we're here, let me just mention, I want to put a shout out and a thanks to our sponsors of this show, which is Squarespace. They make these amazing template websites. Let's have a look at this one here. So this is the website that I use. Easy to load up your images, easy to add your text, to add modules, add section. This particular template is the Wells template. And I know a lot of my followers are using the same template, which is great. And uh, I've actually got like my own loading page so that I've got like an entry page that's a slideshow that changes. Um, and then you've got your social media links here as well. Um, so Squarespace sponsor this particular uh, live social media episodes that we do. Uh, so thanks to Squarespace. If you're interested in a Squarespace website, you can save yourself 10% by using the offer code CARL. That's K-A-R-L at the checkout. Right, let's move on. Um, so um, we were talking about dual polarization. Let me show you, John, uh, it was John Dawson who asked that question. Let me show you some shots where I've used it. So this shot here, uses um, dual polarization. A polarizer on the light and a polarizer on the lens. And this uh, this actually a shoot I did for Candine flooring. And um, because this is uh, synthetic uh, or sort of artificial woods, if you like, some beautiful flooring, amazing stuff. But it had like a slightly different sheen uh, to it than you would get. Uh, and what they were particularly keen to show was to reveal the texture and not reveal just the sheen, for example. Now, it's a very natural sheen, like you would get on a varnished floorboard, but it would, without polarization, of course, some problems. So now you can see in this shot, you can see I can clearly see the texture because they've imprinted their own texture in, so it looks like very, very real floorboards, even though it's sort of um, artificial floorboard, uh, artificial wood, if you like. Um, but because of the way the light was working, I decided to polarize the light and polarize the lens and then I could basically choose which lights to polarize and how much effect and it gave me a really fine control over the sheen of the lighting on the product. So there is a good example of where I use dual polarization. It's a little bit of a tricky technique to get your head around to use uh, but the filters that I use they're like these sheets of filters that clip onto my lights and then I shine them through a scrim um, and those filters are from Lee filters as well. Right, one more question. Ahmed, uh, one more question at the moment that is. Uh, Ahmed 
Al Alabadi says, how do you usually quote or price for your product photography? Well, I've got um, fixed uh, creative day rate and fixed pre-production rates and post-production rates. And um, those uh, rates are obviously available to my clients. And I say to them that a job is going to take one day, two days, three days, and they're just charged at the day rate. The minimum rate, the minimum we'll do is a half day because we block book in half day sessions. Uh, and the half day rate that most photographers charge is slightly more than the day rate because obviously you're not getting a full day. Occasionally, if we've got a big, big project on, like something that's gonna last for seven or eight days, then I might give a discount on the day rate because of the longer period. If you wanna know what my rates are for photography, um, you would have to visit our business section. I'm not gonna reveal them here. Uh, our members on Carl Taylor Education know what my rates are because I describe what the rates should be for different types of commercial photography. And I also say what my own rates are um, that I charge my clients, but I also indicate what other types of genres of photography, um, what you could be expected to charge if your work is at the right level. You can find that in the business section on Carl Taylor Education. Right now, we were just on my Squarespace website at carltaylor.com. I wanna talk about this picture here. This shot we did the other night, you would have seen Ashley dropping handbags left, right and centre. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't her own handbag. Uh, it didn't, no damage came to the handbag actually. It wasn't very dropped from a large height. But we did that shot and why I was really pleased about this shot is that it looks like it's had loads of post-production, but actually it's had none. There is no post-production on that shot apart from me putting my copyright logo in the corner of the picture. Uh, that was lit with quite a special lighting technique called global illumination along with specular illumination as well and that resulted in that particular image and we did that in our live show um, let me just jump over to our live shows page uh, here we are we did that in our live show you can watch it again in the live shows page there okay so that shot was done live no retouching we show you exactly how to do it and that's what we love doing at Carl Taylor Education is bringing these amazing live shows and amazing tips to you. Right, I've plugged our stuff enough now. Let's give some prizes away, shall we? Let's look at giving away a Canon 5D Mark IV and second prize gets a Lee Filters found, no, the second prize gets a Lee Filters Super Stopper uh, filter thing. That's worth $150, I think. Uh, and a Lee Stopper, a Lee Foundation kit as well is second and third prizes. Let's take a look at our shortlisted entries. Let me just get this, uh, hang on, let me get this up first, Ben. Let me just find the folder because I made a folder of shortlisted finalists. And let me just bring these up in a way that I can display them best. I'm just gonna see if I can put them into slideshow mode and into Yes, okay, right, this is our finalists, okay? The theme was red, and um, these were our finalists. One of them is a finalist, but actually it's not a finalist. I've just put it in there to, to say something about it. Um, but all the rest essentially qualified for the theme of red. Um, I don't know all the names to these shots. Um, I might go back and refer to them in a second. This shot, we thought was amazing, but we were just so disappointed that the lipstick wasn't redder or that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the makeup basically wasn't redder because we didn't feel it qualified quite enough for the red theme. Um, and I love this, I, I, incidentally, I've done a shot very similar to this using the, the, the light through the, um, the metal grate to create the, the lighting look here. And I just really loved what the, this photographer did with this shot. But unfortunately, um, it, it wasn't quite right for the theme red, but I just wanted to put a shout out because it was a, a great shot. Okay, we're gonna look through, I'm gonna go through all of the uh, finalists um, that we had, that we narrowed down. So we've got this shot, this one, this one, this one, another, 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 this one as well. And again, remember the theme was red, so you could read into that what you like, but obviously the color red was uh, considering uh, an important 
factor for us. I mean, you can play on words and do different things with these sort of competitions. Um, but these were our favorites that uh, made it into our shortlist. And it took us quite some time to get to this shortlist. And um, some beautiful pictures came in, some lovely entries into our shortlist. And we had hundreds and hundreds of entries to go through. And I went through them with the team here. Um, and these are some of the beautiful uh, pictures that came in. Um, this one, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of them because there's a couple of them that I want to speak about. This one's particularly interesting because at first I was like, what the hell's that? It's, it's two pictures. But actually, this is a picture looking down on the deck of a ship being washed, a red ship. And then that's the water off the side of the ship on the right hand side. And then you've got this wonderful juxtaposition between these two colours, you know, the sort of the cyan blue and then the red, which are actually opposite colours. So it's, it, it's, for a, it's a very dynamic image, so it's quite an interesting one. Um, let me just get out of this a second. So that one, that one we just spoke about was by Zay Yar. Um, I want to put a shout out to, to this guy as well, because we didn't know, the, we don't look at the names when we're judging, but he had this amazing entry and he also had this amazing entry. So he actually got two pictures into our shortlist. Uh, and as I said, we don't know who, who the names are. When we judge the pictures, we don't know the names. We're just looking through the shots as we go through them. Uh, there, there were some other uh, great entries um, that, that, that it came in. Obviously, you saw all of the different entries. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm now going to show you the uh, shortlisted the final shortlists from that. Um, I, we have this one from Adam Borman. Uh, we have this shot from Joshua Phillips. We have, where is it? This shot from Patrick Ish. This one from uh, Siddhar uh, Sahin. And uh, did I mark? all of those up I think that's oh no there's this one up here as well let me uh let me just bring up a slideshow on these shortlists so we've got five I believe here yes yeah, five finalists if you like five images that we considered absolutely superb absolutely superb entries into our competition red let's look at just these five so we have this one this one this one this one and this one. Now, let's just talk about each of these entries. First of all, we loved this shot. We loved the, the symmetry of it, the lighting. Everything was absolutely bang on on that one. Beautiful product shot, beautifully lit, lovely tones, looked gorgeous. Uh, I loved this shot as well. I felt this one was particularly strong because not only uh, did it have the elements of red, uh, and the red background and the red writing, but all of the words painted on the lady, on the model, all relate to the word red or have some sort of link to the word red, like fire, cherry, love, ladybird, strawberry, Santa, all of these things. So I thought it was a very clever entry, this one. So uh, that, was, that was a really nice one as well. Beautiful shot here with what looks like uh, an abstract detail on a luxury sports car. Loved the lighting, loved the look of it, the feel of it. Thought it was a, a great image. This one, exquisite shot of this uh, bottle of wine and glass of wine. Just a beautiful, gentle, lovely gradient lighting executed perfectly well. A hint of red, but obviously we know that's red wine as well. So there's that sort of double play on it as well with that one. And then this beautiful shot with uh, the uh, model looking through all of the red fabrics and holding the red uh, umbrella. Thought this was a lovely uh, composed shot, really nice use of occlusion, lovely lighting as well. So those were our five finalists. Shall we find out who the winner is? Who the winner of the Canon 5D Mark IV is and who the winner of these other two prizes. Well, I am going to reveal the winner. Now, what I'm going to do is I've just got to get out of this because I've just got to get their names right. Now, in first place, first place, where is it? Where is first place out of those one? First place is Adam Borman 
I believe it's Adam Borman, first place. Adam is from Canada. Well done, Adam. You have won yourself a wonderful Canon 5D Mark IV camera body. So big congratulations to you. I hope you're happy with that prize. And remember guys, the, the, we, we're paying for these prizes. This is not given to us by Canon. Um, we're, we're, we're paying for these prizes because we love these competitions, love running this competition. Um, now, Adam, we think that's a fantastic entry. Ticks all the boxes for us on the color red. So very well done to you. Second prize, Super Stopper Filter goes to Joshua Phillips. Joshua Phillips with that wonderful abstract detail uh, on, I think that's a sports car, but we just love the look of it, love the lighting of it. So Joshua, well done, you get second prize. Third prize goes to this uh, wonderful entry from Siddhar Sahin. Now, bizarrely, Siddhar Sahin actually won the Canon 5D Mark IV. Now some may say, that's not fair, he's just won another prize. Well, he has, but he's submitted a wonderful image. And as I say, when we're judging these things, we don't look at the names. So Siddhar Sahin, you are third place uh, today. Fourth place goes to Patrick Ish. Now, we don't normally do a fourth place, okay? But because it's Christmas, we've decided to add a fourth and fifth place. We're so happy with the entries. So we're gonna send out our uh, lighting gels pack, uh, colored lighting gels. So there's about, I don't know, 20 or 30 different colored lighting gels, effect lighting that you can trim down. It's got its own trimmer in there. Um, you can use this for any brand of lighting. You cut them down to the size of your studio lighting or cut them in smaller pieces for speed lights or whatever you wanna use. So these are very popular. So we're giving a prize to you as well. Patrick, we'll get that in the post to you. And uh, so he's fourth place. And then finally in uh, fifth place, we was um, Arthur, uh, I can't, Arthur Fronczak, I believe you uh, pronounced that. And we thought this was a very uh, clever entry. Uh, so well done to you, Arthur. You're also going to get uh, one of these prizes. Now, as always with every competition, because we see this all the time, uh, National Geographic, uh, BBC Wildlife, all, all these different competitions, everyone has an opinion. Everyone said, oh, I think this one should be a winner. I think that one should be a winner that one maybe should be a winner. And of course you're entitled to your opinions and everyone's got a different opinion. We judge the competitions here as a team. Uh, I make the final decision, but we do the shortlisting, first round, second round, third round. And hey guys, we're paying for the prizes. We're outlaying for a Canon 5D Mark IV for the winner. So we'll decide on, on who the winner is. Uh, but obviously please feel free to leave your comments below. It is always interesting to hear what other people think about the shortlist. And I hope you agree that the uh, 39 entries there on the shortlist were great entries. So there's our winners. Well done, Adam Borman for winning a Canon 5D Mark IV body. Right, let's take a few more questions. Uh, and um, let's see where we're at. Let me just get back to my notes of where we're at. Let me have another simp sip of my coffee with all of this excitement. So we have, um, oh, we have a video coming out on YouTube. I think, is it, is it today or, no, tomorrow? No, Thursday. Wacom, um, Wacom Cintiq versus ISO monitor. So that for those of you that are interested in that, I bought a Wacom Cintiq uh, retouching tablet, uh, the one with the screen, a couple of years ago. And I did promise to do a review on what it was like to use it. And I'm sorry, guys, it was very late, very lazy me. I used it for quite some time. Uh, and then I switched back to using my ISO with a smaller Wacom tablet. And in this video that we're gonna publish on, on YouTube on Thursday, um, I'll explain why. The ins and outs of how I felt for retouching one was better than the other, et cetera, et cetera. So you can look out for that video on Thursday. Um, right, what else have we got? I've covered Broncolor Users Group. Um, we've covered the other items there. Obviously, I wanna wish everyone a Merry Christmas as well, because it's soon Christmas and we'll all be taking a wonderful Christmas break. But before we do that, before we see you again with the next Q&A in the new year, let's answer a few more Q&A, or Qs as they were. 
Um, so, Royal Studios says, if there is no Broncolor lighting system, which will you prefer? Um, I used Elenchrom for a long time. I've used Profoto, I've rented Profoto. Um, and those, with, with Broncolor, those are the only three lighting systems I've used. So, um, Broncolor is what I use now, I have used for many years. Before that, I've used Elenchrom, and sometimes when I'm working overseas, if I haven't been able to rent Broncolor, I've rented Profoto. So uh, that's the answer. Paul Reinhardt, Reinhardt, hi Carl. What focal length lens do you recommend for portraits on a crop sensor? Yeah, that's a tricky one because I use an 85 millimeter on a full frame 35 mil camera, and I use a 100 millimeter on a medium format camera. I'm not quite sure in, you know, in matching focal lengths, you could say maybe 50 millimeter, but maybe you could also use 70 to 80 millimeter and you might just have to move a little bit further back. Um, I've not actually used a crop sensor camera uh, in any professional level. I've had a play around with one, but I've never used one in a professional level. So I probably not the best person to ask. Subra the basis, I believe that is, says, how do we take good photos with manual settings? Well, actually, that's the only way we teach people to shoot on Carl Taylor Education is using manual settings. We basically do everything in manual. We teach you understanding the exposure scale, understanding uh, ISO, aperture, shutter speeds, so that you learn it very quickly, very easily, and that you know it inside out because once you know it inside out, nothing can phase you at all about using any type of camera, okay? Because everything in photography on a camera level relates back to aperture, uh, shutter speed, uh, and an ISO within the camera. Um, so, you know, those things we teach you on how to use it in manual. And once you know how to use a camera in manual, you're not scared of anything. You can then basically, you know everything about what settings you need to apply. Um, and you can learn that over on our, our system. Um, so, um, yeah. How do we take good photos in manual? You have to learn how to use a camera in manual. Uh, Lewis Arazo, will you add a class that teaches conceptual thinking in the future? Um, well, we've kind of got uh, a, a something similar to that that's covered in a couple of our live shows. There was one of our live shows called The Emotion of Light, I think it was, where we look at some of the conceptual thinking and the theory stuff on uh, lighting and colour and a little bit of that. Uh, but we have had a few requests about how, yeah, how to conceptually create images, design images, think about it. So, yeah, I will, cons I will certainly uh, consider that, Lewis or Louis. Um, Aditya Mankali says, hello, sir. Since you've shot a music video, um, I want to know how much your photography knowledge helped you in it and how. Well, I kind of did a music video once for a friend. Um, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was just, we had a go at it and see what it came out like. Uh, more recently, I made a short film uh, about a scallop diver, which uh, I really quite liked the result on that one. I thought I was, I was quite pleased with it. Um, you can see that short film over on Hasselblad's YouTube channel. The music video, obviously any level of photography knowledge is going to help you, but video and filming is a slightly different concept to stills because the most important thing really with filming is you're telling more of a story. So the narrative is, is sort of more important and the way you link the visuals together and cut it and edit it all has a bearing on the way the thing feels. Whereas obviously one still image, you still need narrative in there. You, you probably need greater degree of accuracy on lighting and framing and composition because you're studying that one image for a long time. Video, you get away with a lot more, but you don't get away with a bad story, okay? So the concept of story needs to be more important in video. But obviously, yeah, skills like exposure, lenses, composition, lighting, and all of that stuff will help, will help you with video. Um, what do we got next? Carlos Rosales Rocco. Carl, what is your opinion about specializing or not in a specific field of photography? Regards from Moscow. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I've done quite a few different types of photography. I started off in photojournalism. Then I moved into commercial advertising photography and sort of more general commercial advertising, everything from hospitality, food, products, lifestyle, all sorts. Now I specialize mostly in product and advertising photography. 
but I don't think it hurts to do a few other genres of photography. Some very successful photographers do portraiture, do fashion, do a bit of advertising. Other photographers specialize more niche and uh, that works well for them too. I think you just gotta go where, where your heart is. Whatever speaks to you the most, whatever you enjoy doing the most. I enjoy a little bit of variety, so I just shoot you know, the things that I enjoy shooting. Um, next question. For shooting people in a huge ex exhibition hall with no ceiling, even fluorescent light from above, what your portable lighting kit would be? Um, well, it depends. What, what do you mean shooting people? Do you mean a group of people that you're putting together as a group shot? Or are you shooting basketball players running around a court? Or I'm afraid the question isn't quite uh, you know, detailed enough for me to answer. Um, but my portable lighting kit would be, I use move packs, the bronze color move packs, or you could use, I use the Cirrus uh, lithium battery lights. And when you're in a big hall, you can either choose to light into the ceiling if it's a neutral or white coloured ceiling and bounce light around or you're going with directional light or you're going with a mixture of some bounce light and some directional light but it would all depend on the subject that you're shooting within that hall uh, and also what you're allowed to do with your lighting in that space. Uh, Mohammed Baba Mughal says hi Carl from Pakistan just wanted to know whether all your educational videos are available on DVDs or memory card uh, which we can purchase. No we uh, we stopped selling DVDs many years ago um, they kind of DVDs went out of fashion so our system and our platform is all online uh, and all available for £12 per month that's $14 per month. Andrew Henning, hi Carl great to be back with you after a few months away anything coming on bog standard photojournalism i.e not National Geographic style but local newspaper work. Um, no not really to be honest Andrew I haven't thought of anything on that that's quite specialist we've got a couple of modules as you may already know on sort of um, journalistic photo opportunity or reportage styles but I haven't done anything more specific focused on that but we'll make a note of it for you. Catherine St Haynes, hi Carl, when photographing images containing lots of white what tips have you got please? Um, well don't overexpose the whites if you don't want to. Um, yeah you haven't kind of explained why you'd have lots of whites so I mean this is a problem that wedding photographers come across all the time they're photographing like a, a bride in a white wedding dress potentially inside a white marquee or against a white marquee with lots of white and flowers and floral arrangements and they've always got to be careful to maintain the detail in that dress and not let the highlights burn out obviously shooting in raw you can pull some of that highlight detail back um, but careful control of your lighting careful control of your exposure making sure you don't clip those whites out uh, is important but the context of how you're shooting and why you've got all these bits of white in your photograph you have to think about carefully because um, the way the eye flows around a photo and where it goes based on high contrast points or the brightest points is also all important so um, you know I, I, you, you need to think about this globally. Um, Ernesto how much do you charge for copyright? Um, well I, I charge for my day rate uh, which includes licensing the image for a specific period of time. That's covered in our business section on Carl Taylor Education. Uh, Hurad Famaja says, uh, Hi, is a Hasselblad H4D40 good to start on fashion and product photography at a high level? I only have an 80mm lens on it. What other lenses do you recommend? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean the H4D40 is a great camera. Uh, the 80mm lens is actually a great lens for product photography. Maybe you'll need a set of extension tubes as well. You won't need the macro lens. I generally use the extension tubes. That will serve you well for a lot of product photography. I really like the 100mm lens for beauty uh, work as well. Um, and you might want to consider going a little bit wider. We had a um, really great fashion photographer, Daria Belakova, on one of our live shows recently, which you can watch on replay. Um, she uses 50 mil uh, for a lot of her fashion work. Uh, Daniel says, Carl, what is the best way to simulate one source window lighting? One source window lighting. Well, um, I guess you've got to consider what you mean by window light, okay? Because a window light, effectively a softbox, is the same shape like a window. But how far away your subject is from the window depends on how big the room is, okay? 
so if you're looking like a Rembrandt style lighting, it's more of a small window up from above and higher contrast. But if you've got a small room with white walls, then a lot of light is bouncing off the walls back in. So you should be using reflector panels to represent that. If you're looking at a north facing window or a south facing window, a north facing window, the light will be softer, more uh, solid, like homogenous, uh, and it will be bluer. Um, if you're looking at a south facing window, there's a good chance that the light might have some direct sunlight coming through that window as well. And one technique I use is to have the soft box uh, on my subject. And then I also put another light in front of the softbox, a point light source, a bare bulb light source, and adjust the ratios of the two so that I can also bring a little bit of sparkle back into the shot. Um, Dixit Shah says, how different are square softboxes than octagon softboxes for shooting portraits? They're not really different. Obviously, the reflection in the eye will be different. It's just the size of the softbox. I like the Octabox 150 because it's big and it's kind of round shaped, so it makes a nice catch light in the eyes. Um, but the 150, uh, 120 by 180 big rectangle softbox is also really, really good, but it's harder to get up high like an Octobox because it is so big. Um, but I always say go with the biggest softbox you can afford uh, because you can always make a softbox smaller by masking it. Sayan says, uh, Sayan Misra says, how, Hi Carl, how can I get my first client being just starting a photography business? Um, it's a tricky one, but market yourself. It's, you've got to market yourself well. Um, there's no point sitting at home not talking about what you do, not talking about uh, what you offer, otherwise no one's going to know about it. So it's very important to uh, market yourself. Uh, you need a good website, you uh, need uh, good promotional material. In the old days when I was first starting out I used to use brochures, printed materials, send postcards to art directors, knock on doors, do as much marketing work. But you can only market yourself if your work is to the right standard. Um, that you want to in, in the sort of area that you want to appeal to. So um, you've, got to, you've got to think about marketing yourself. Uh, KIA TV, what's a good size softbox for moving around shooting models on the go? Um, I actually quite like the, uh, the Bron Octabox 75 for on the go lighting. Put it on a big pole and have an assistant hold it and move around with that one. Um, next question says, pick agent, how do we enter your competitions? Is it possible to take part in a competition without being a member? No, no it's not, I'm afraid. Uh, you have to be a member to enter our competitions. Um, we, we have to serve our members. Our members support us. Our members allow us to do this and actually allow, you to, uh, allow us to bring you the free stuff that we put out on social media as well. It's our members that hold this whole thing together and, and we're very grateful to them. So if anyone's gonna win our prizes, I'm afraid it is going to be our members. Um, Aaron, and it's not expensive to be a member. We've got thousands and thousands of dollars worth of training on our platform available for just £12 per month, including live shows, live member critiques, tons of great courses, two new courses every month, and customer support as well. So we, we hope we're offering a great service. Our customers think so. Just check out some of the feedback in the comment section on our website. Uh, Erin says, do you think colour grading is manipulation? No, of course not. Uh, colour grading is essential. Um, I, what I do with my images, most of the, the, the Photoshop work on my own work is restricted really to uh, burning and dodging and coloration. So people look at a shot like this and they say, oh, that might be loads of Photoshop. But actually there's virtually no Photoshop in there other than some colour grading, contrast, and that's it. Everything in that shot, I shot it like that, okay? Um, there are some obvious images where you have to use a bit of Photoshop work. Um, this one actually is the liquid hitting that thing. But I had uh, an acrylic rod holding the object in place and I retouched that out afterwards. So there are situations where, yeah, you, it's unavoidable. Uh, skin retouching generally needed on close-ups on models but most of my shots is a limited amount of retouching. And that retouching is color correction, color grading, and what we call burning and dodging. That's shading areas of the image, knocking back, making bits darker, making bits brighter, increasing contrast in certain areas to draw the eye around a picture in a certain way. Um, and actually that's, um, that's, uh, that's got something that's gonna be a topic 
of uh, a workshop that we're, we're running soon in March. Check out that workshop on Carl Taylor Education at the top, very top menu at the top of the website. You can see about that particular workshop. There's not many places left on that workshop, it's almost full. Uh, next question. Um, da, 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 da. Corin Wilkinson says, as a student trying to enter the working world of product photography, do you have any tips on getting the front door? Uh, you have to get to the front door first, Corin. You've got to knock on the door. You've got to be committed. You've got to have a good portfolio and you mustn't be shy, okay? I remember a lot of people, I know some photographers, they, they just were reluctant to pick up the phone, reluctant to call people or email people. Uh, if you're not good at that stuff, get someone to do it for you. Get a marketing person. If you're too busy or you like, I know, I know other photographers that are very busy, they don't even have time to do their own marketing. So they employ a part-time person, a few hours a week to do their mailers for them, do their marketing, get their printing done, try and get appointments for them, and then they go and see. But you've got to be willing to get these face-to-face -face meetings and getting that personal touch and showing your portfolio in person. Uh, it's all about marketing uh, and, and marketing yourself well uh, to get through the door. Lars Dork says, hi, Mr. Taylor. What do you think about the Fuji film system? Um, I don't know. I assume you're referring to one of their camera systems, but they do a lot of different camera systems. Uh, Dimpness says, I'm looking forward to the review video. Uh, actually, have you got one on laptop? I don't know quite what he means about that. Maybe he's referring to our critique our product photography critique tomorrow uh, Kiran Paramesh hello greetings Carl what are the prerequisites to be a successful stock photographer uh, come on guys you got you'd have to shoot a mate you got to shoot amazing stock that's the first uh, prerequisite and then you've got to get that work into a good stock library um, what else could it be John Thompson, what would be a good entry, high level, high speed broncolor lighting kit? Uh, well, it's got to be the Cirrus. The Cirrus is the only high speed entry level. You've got the Cirrus and then you've got the expensive, more expensive Scoro packs. The Cirrus range is the budget entry to get you into that one nine thousandth of a second flash duration. Uh, and that's a T0.1 measurement as well. Um, Reese Giddens, hi Carl, have you got any tips on a new photographer trying to get in the commercial? For th that I've already answered, that has come up a few times about marketing. How to capture noticeable work? Um, well, Mahesh, you've got you to just sh keep shooting great pictures. You've got to learn photography, the art of photography. Don't worry about the gear, worry about seeing, worry about vision, worry about understanding what makes pictures work and concentrating and working harder on the art of photography. Right, we're not gonna take any more questions now. Um, I'm just gonna finish off these last few questions. Uh, Piang, hi Carl, what is the most important thing when we shoot normal headshots? Can you give me one or two tips? Uh, okay, right, if the camera there is, is the, the camera, don't shoot people square on like this unless you're doing it for effect. Uh, for headshots, I normally turn them at a 45 degree angle to camera and then um, I get their head to turn. For guys in suits, I normally get them to put their hands in their pockets makes the shoulders sit a little bit more nicely. You can't see their hands where they are anyway because you're cropping them to a headshot. And um, for girls uh, and for everyone, just make sure they stand up straight, get them to sort of elevate their neck, uh, nice confident posture, a little bit of a smile, not too cheesy. And depending on the age or the type of people, soft lighting, big soft boxes close, but there are other types of lighting setups. And we have, uh, Juz Piang, we have some amazing modules on business portraiture and lighting in our portrait section on Carl Taylor Education. So if you want to just pay $14 and then cancel, you can go in and check all of those out. You'd have one month membership to do it. I, I implore anyone who's on the fence, sitting on the fence about our education platform to just try it. Go in and try it for $14 for one month and just see what you think. Because for $14, you could absorb so much information, tons and tons of stuff, and you can cancel online. You don't have to call us to cancel. You don't need to write us a big letter. You can just push a button that says cancel. So it is worth trying it just for $14 because all of these sort of questions about pricing, marketing, business, portraiture, lighting, it's all in there on that platform. You can find out everything and tons more and watch some amazing live shows with top photographers for $14. Just, I think that's what I would implore you to do. 
Uh, Dixie Shah, what is the difference between square and octa octa We've already answered that uh, question as well. Um, now, where is it? Bayou says, hi Carl, I'm Bayou from Indonesia. How can I become your student? I'm afraid you can't Bayou. Um, we uh, have uh, fully staffed here. We sometimes take um, work experience people in from universities um, as assistants uh, uh, now and again. Uh, we run this operation with about seven staff and uh, obviously I've already got assistants working uh, with me on the photography uh, and we, uh, as I say, occasionally take uh, students um, from universities uh, or schools in uh, on work experience when we can. Uh, Walid says, um, Walid Sayadi says, what is the most important to shoot the moon? Um, well, it depends how serious you are about it. And the moon moves, okay? So you can't use a very slow shutter speed because the moon is moving. So especially if you're shooting it with a telephoto lens. But the great thing with the cameras of today, you can get your ISO up to 1600, 3200, and, and the grain is minimal these days on the high ISO on modern cameras, which means you can get a fast shutter speed on shooting the moon. So I like the shots of the moon, and I've used to do loads of these, not when you've got a full moon, but when you've got a half moon, because the light's coming in from the side, and that gives more texture. And actually on like a 500 mil lens, or if you haven't got a 500 mil lens, like say you've got a 200 mil, use a two times converter, double up, put camera on a tripod, whack the ISO up high, get the moon in shot and see which way it's moving and then it's going to move across your shot. So sort of prepare yourself, don't put your thing on it because by the time you're ready to take the picture it would have moved, especially on a four or five hundred mil lens. And then, you know, on a half moon, on a clear night, then you can get some great shots. You can see the mountain ranges, the craters, and when the moon's coming in from the side, uh, the light's coming in from the side like that, you can see the shadows within the craters and everything is absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, right, now, that's it, I'm afraid, for, um, for today's Q&A. Uh, what was the name of the winner again? Adam Borman. So big thanks, uh, big well done again to Adam. Well done to all our entries. Thank you to everyone for entering the competition. If you didn't win this time, then uh, good luck for competitions next year. We've got four major competitions next year, again with some great prizes. You can see what they are. You can see the themes of the competitions. They're already listed for all of 2019. You can see those on Carl Taylor Education. Uh, go up to the top menu on the right where it says login and you can see go down to competitions you can see all of the competitions for next year and all of the prizes and all of the themes uh, the whole team and I would like to wish all of our members and all of our followers of course on social media a very happy Christmas very festive uh, holiday period we hope you have a nice break we will be back with another Q&A with you in the new year we've got some great YouTube videos coming out uh, in the next week as well, maybe keep you entertained. And obviously, if you get the chance, check out the, the, the offerings that we have on uh, Carl Taylor Education. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.